just coming up in the next shift. Yeah. And I will leave those questions for them. Whoa. Hey, somebody's awake out there. No, it's still there. All that wow. <laughs> All right, Dave, do your magic. That oh, one's cool looking. <laughs> that face. Very interesting. Is that a dorsal or a parasite? I think it's a dorsal. Hmm. We need it to deploy the landing gear. I don't know if it has any. No landing gear. Like how he's oriented into the current. Yeah. Come a little wide there, please. Lack of scales on the top of the head, indicative of Halosaur. Halosaur. Vandia. All right. Species. Is that what it means when they say SP? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's a big fan like coral. That Whoa. What were they calling that fish? Halosaur. Or it's probably Halosaur or something. Get his house. Yeah, right. so yeah what's that? Is that an anemone? What Looks like the same that? kind of an enemy that we saw that was closed up oh, earlier. Yeah. Big Ooh. one. Or Look similar. inside and see if it has the same stump. Yeah. Interesting. Big one. Mm. Weird. It doesn't seem to have that bright orange middle no, bit. No, it doesn't. Does it? Very fancy. Yeah. Interesting hat. Yeah, upside down. Could Go ahead and push on hat. in there. <laughs> upside down hat. Opposed to the right side up hat. Maybe it does have. Well, it's also closed. Oh. Huh. Hmm. Come a little wide, please. Very cool. Full wide, please. So a lot of action here in the control van as we have a watch change. Keep those questions coming, especially biology questions. Yeah, gonna I'm gonna. I've got them all saved up. There. So you might hear a little silence as we change ships. We'll be passing the torch. Thank you for joining us. We've enjoyed your questions and song suggestions. Caramel potatoes. Mm -hmm. 
There's a big fish. Oh. Hello to all our viewers. We are just completing a watch change, which is why it's been quiet for a couple of minutes. And we're just getting settled in to the nighttime 12 to 4 watch. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Hi, watch, I should say. <laughs> hey. Hello. Good morning. Yeah, good morning. I never know what to say at the 
12 switches. Good day. That's what I always think of. But it is morning. It's whatever you feel. <laughs> What's the speed of the moves that he's been putting in? 0 0.2 knots. Okay. Um, and we're at a stop right now. Steve, is it true that we're looking for a rock? Yes, we are. Ooh. Yeah, in fact, uh, again, that magic number, 2208. Oh, we are nearly there. We're at yeah. 2207. <laughs> okay. Gone too far. Rock hunting time. Ooh, the last group was only six meters off in depth. Oh, my gosh. Six meters? They, what were uh, they we went last up to us. time? Eleven? Was that yeah, one? eleven. Yep. Oh man. No oh, pressure, Gabby. It says ish. So. What's that? that? No pressure. I know it's tough. I didn't realize you could add ish to the end. I feel like we could really. Yeah, we, we could do ish better than ish. Ish Yeah. <laughs> this area doesn't look that great for rocks. Yeah, it's uh definitely kind of nodule-y, not very uh. Doesn't look very breakable, kind of stuff. Okay, what if I saw, well, still got a little bit of swing, but what about, mm, those look attached. Okay, I'm gonna head up a little bit further, see if we yeah. run into something. Did the watch before us take many samples? Yeah, how does that look? Yeah, uh, there's a couple of boxes. Well, only one box is left open. Um, we have two Niskins left, and we need uh, two more rocks. We also have two slurps open, but uh, not sure if we want to do those or not. So the slurp is out of commission now. I don't think we'll be able to get any more slurps this dive. Okay, that sounds good. Thank you, Data. What about this one? Uh -huh. The On the left? Yes. The good size. We we don't have a, a full open compartment, a uh, big compartment left. Ooh. There's but a little, maybe a little one next to it. What about uh, this one here? Do you think you can break that or is that Okay, solid? let me see. We get triple bonus points if there's any attached biology. Okay. Triple bonus points? Are we allowed to double up rocks and bins? Yes. As long as they're really dissimilar. Another potential candidate if it doesn't work over in the distance. Okay. Sounds good. Go for zoom. That's good right there. Can you come out just a little bit? 
Briggs. Yeah. Bridge, no. Hold position. Uh, I no, can't no. hear you. Sorry. I do not. I, didn't, I don't see it. One second. Let me. In bubble. Oh, okay. Cool. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Just curious about where it's coming from. Okay, right, the the sort of lower cheek there, maybe. Yep, I know. Um, that what's going on? Look. Okay, you also don't have any bow thruster on. I don't know if you know that. Okay, um, Steve, this is not, uh, this one did not come up. Yeah, we can okay, look go around on. for another one. I don't see much of anything else here that's going to be broken off. Okay. Um, so we're moving south right now, and his bow thruster is not going on. Okay. Just heads up. Thank you so much. Okay, Steve. Let me yeah, I don't see anything in this Say immediate again? area. Okay. Copy. Thank you. Hey Steve, I think we're gonna uh we're just gonna chase the ship here a little bit. They've got a bit of an issue with the bow thruster, so I think once they get the ship stable then we'll just hold off on the sample for now. Yeah, I hear you. We're going on an adventure. Yeah. <laughs> More random sampling. Well, in the meantime, Steve, mm -hmm. apparently the watch before us uh, saved a bunch of questions for a marine biologist because the geologist didn't want to answer them. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's how we're going to play it, is it? <laughs> uh, so maybe we can, there's a couple of questions about sponges, um, kind of from the end of the last watch, but the biggest one being from a few different people is, are sponges related to fungi? Which... The answer is no. Sponges yeah, are animals. Pretty distant. <laughs> yeah. But we can see the relation sometimes with the shape. Um, but some people are curious about sponges in general. Do they have predators? 
And on these dives, often we see sponges, big sponges growing upward and wondering why we don't see kind of baby sponges right next to it. Yeah, yeah. Um, we, we do see uh, smaller sponges throughout the dive. It, oftentimes, the smaller sponges are, are ones we have to really kind of zoom in close on because they may be, you know, small, um, you know, a couple centimeters maximum in size until they get really big enough. Uh, but we do see small sponges, and, and there has been some evidence of recruitment in this area. Um, typically, we see the smaller sponges when we sample a rock, and they're, they're usually attached to the rocks. Uh, so we know that there's some pretty strong recruitment at some of these sites. Uh, what was the first part of that question? Do sponges have predators? Yeah. Yes, they do. Um, so, so there are some some sea stars. Um, I'm thinking specifically of Pythonaster that uh, has been seen recently uh, by myself and, and others uh, preying on sea stars. Some pretty good imagery of that. Uh, it seems like they're grazing on the on the sponge itself, but there's always a chance that they could just be after the smaller organisms that are on or within the sponge. Uh, huh. But yeah, it's a uh, most of the sponge, you know, it, it doesn't have true tissues like a coral or, you know, any of the other metazoans. So it's kind of um, kind of a low energy food uh, for predators. But, you know, at the same time, they don't move very much. So, you know, <laughs> it might be cost benefit in their favor. I never thought about that, the nutrition content of the sponge. But it makes sense, kind of what we know. Yeah, they're mostly yeah. glass, uh, the mass of it. At, le at least at these depths. Seems like sea stars eat almost everything down here. Oh yeah, yeah, <laughs> they're, they're the top predators. Um, they're efficient things, but I don't really know of very many fish who will take on a sea star. Also, yeah. <laughs> themselves, uh, sea stars are probably not all that nutritious. Um, lots of ossicles and calcareous plates and things. The only thing I've ever seen eating a sea star is a seagull, and it was the most impressive thing. Yeah. I mean, I think it was very painful for the seagull. But. Uh, yeah, I, I would bet. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure there's some good nutritious, you know, gonadal material or material inside the sponge or uh, sea star arms, but we just don't see them very much uh, being preyed upon. Yeah, occasionally you'll see brisingids uh, earlier on the watch uh, this afternoon we did see some uh, brisingids being preyed upon well not preyed upon but you know had been missing some arms so there was something eating them but more often than not it might actually be other sea stars or urchins mm. okay I'm, I'm reminded of a very like striking dive we did in the mona passage uh, on the okeanos explorer a couple years ago um, where we saw at about a couple hundred meters, much shallower, just pure sea star carnage uh, and sea urchin carnage. Um, the echinoderms eating other echinoderms, it was crazy. There was gardens of um, crinoids and the pencil urchins would eat the stalks of the crinoids. Huh. And then after they eat the stalks of the crinoids, you know, crinoids can't really do anything uh, but, you know, I guess they're eating be eating slowly enough that they don't realize they're being eaten um, because they don't really make an attempt to escape. Um, these were the crinoids that uh, had an ability to move and, and replace themselves, the uh, endoxacrinus. Oh, so they could have moved, but they didn't. Oh, that's yeah. tricky. And then and then there was also this, uh, this specific type of sea star or uh, sea urchin we saw that had these broad kind of spatulate, spiny, thorny um, spines. And it used those spines to pin down some of the swimming sea stars. So it would crawl up to them, pin them down with these spines, and then eat the arm tips. What? Uh, yeah. It was <laughs> brutal. It's so brutal. Oh my goodness. Yeah, much shallower you see some, you know, some pretty... Horrific carnage uh, <laughs> predation in 
more realistic time scales than you see down here. You know, that are relevant to us on the order of minutes. Yeah. <laughs> I imagine everything's just closer together, too, so. Right, and there's more things. Yeah. I don't. I have a partial answer to the question we had earlier today about the nodules oh. uh, from one of our collaborators at USGS, or scientists ashore rather. Um, why all the nodules, if we come across a nodule field, are roughly the same size? And it really has to do with the size of the nucleus that they start to precipitate around. It generally indicates that the nucleus is kind of the same material or roughly the same size when it starts to form. So this is probably millions of years old, uh, these nuclei. Who knows what they are? They could be sand grains or gravel or mm. something. But they all precipitate at roughly the same rate. That's why they're all the same size. Ah, that makes sense. Thank you. <laughs> now, the question I still had was, if that happens, then how are they... Is there some sorting going on over time that I'm not sure about? Like, if you disturb a nodule field, say there's an earthquake or something, and you get nodules that fall down slope, do they, like, resort themselves? Or do, like, new ones start to form? I'm not sure. I'm sure it's a very slow process. Yeah. Huh. Definitely not something we're going to observe in billions of years. Yeah, who knows what this planet will look like in billions of years. All right, I got another sponge question for you, if you're ready. <laughs> sure. Where does the sponge get the material from to make the glass structure? Does that come from its food, or does it use other materials around it? Because they're silica-based, right? Yeah, silica. So they're um, getting yeah, this material from both food sources and the water column. Um, you know, there, there are a lot of organisms that make uh, their skeletons out of silica in the plankton. Uh, you know, diatoms specifically uh, have tests that are made out of silica. Uh, they sink to the bottom. But more than likely, they're probably getting it straight out of the water. Hmm. Uh, yeah. Interesting. Yeah, different, there are different silica levels uh, all around the world and all the different ocean layers. Um, so I think the bottom waters and, and intermediate waters and deep waters are relatively silica rich. The surface oceans at the high latitudes, I think, are might be more silica poor because of all the plankton that extract that silica from the water column. And those are areas where we would see sponges with different. What so there are sponges that aren't silica based. They're carbon. What are they? What's there's a couple different types. Um, 
There, there are calcareous sponges calcareous, in the shallow ocean. That's the word yep. I was trying to think of. Calcium carbonate. Um, there are also uh, proteinaceous sponges made out of uh, spongin. Which is, these are probably the ones that you're more familiar with that form like bath sponges. Mm -hmm. Right now, for folks ashore, we're kind of just trying to keep the bottom in sight while the ship is trying to get regain, regain position here. Going on a bit of a sleigh ride. <laughs> it does kind of go like that. It be seasonal, yeah. And some life sighting, sea cucumbers and corals. Yeah, Walteria, last sponge. Seen some Chrysogorgia colonies as well as uh, a couple of black corals, maybe bathypathies. Now we've come up uh, since our last watch about 700 meters. Looks really similar. I would say it's more sedimented here, but I suspect as we come up to the top of the seamount, we may or may not see more hard substrate. So the, this one has kind of a dual peak uh, and waypoint nine, which is let's say a couple hundred meters away at least, is still uh, still up there. But then there's this saddle, which has been in this part of the world. Uh, and every time we've entered a saddle, it's been pretty species poor, um, mm. not not very current scoured, uh, lots of sediment. So we'll see what we can find between those two peaks, but we're going to try and check them both out. Nav, do you have a weather update? Does it uh, look okay? Be a black coral there. That one's actually a pretty good 
easy one to identify. That's Heteropathies Americana. Is that the one we imaged right before our last watch change? Yeah. Yeah, I think it was the first one we saw of last between last cruise and this cruise. It's very unusual because it's quite common, I had thought. Okay, yeah, that was cool because the like stem came up and mm -hmm. then there was that little bunch of tentacles there. Yeah. Or yeah, polyps high, there, really high density polyps. Yep. The black corals are, are unique compared to the, the octa corals. They have a very different body plan. Um, so they have a skeleton, right? But since they belong to the group that are known as the hexacorals, they must have this kind of like six way uh, symmetry. And so their mouths are actually very um, flat against the skeleton. And they have two, uh, three pairs of polyps, or tentacles rather, around the mouth of the polyp. So it actually, yeah, they kind of, the polyp is elongate along the skeleton. It's really bizarre. The mouths are very, very small. So we have a question about our last dive, since we have now brought samples up to the ship. Um, a couple of people curious about the biological samples we collected. And then, Ashley, maybe you want to talk a little bit about, since you helped sort them, but what did we bring up and what did you all find last night? Um, yeah, it was, it was really exciting. We got to uh, sample a couple of biological uh, specimens from the bottom. Um, we took up a really fun uh, new species of sunstar. So that was really cool to kind of be the first couple of people to, to handle that, I think. Um, we also got a couple of sea cucumbers, um, a lot of rocks uh, with some brittle star associates, which were really uh, fun to examine. It was, it was very interesting, very, very cool to be a part of that. Was one, of, one of the sea cucumbers was, was a sea pig is what they call it? Yeah. That was cute. <laughs> it, was, it was very cute. I love very those. squishy. Yeah. I love those. <laughs> Halosar down there. I think I wrote Halosar somewhere up. Uh, oh, yep, it's up here in the chat. We need a spelling. He was headed for 090 heading. It'll, it'll take a little bit to get the, the current uh, reading back in there again. I see that. Goodness. That's a DP screen. DP two.
I'm good, thanks. <laughs> Maybe. It's another uh, Remula Gorgia. And then Bathy Pathies. We don't need to go all the way back there. We can just go up slope whenever they get position. Awesome. That's what I was hoping would happen. Um, yes, it was uh, 115 degrees. Uh, it Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think at the first we were drifting, but you're right, once he got the DP back in, he was kind of heading Interesting on the Argus view, it almost looks like we're on a little like bubble. Oh, now the angle changed a bit, but. Moving fast. Oh, we can start to look for something. Um, yeah, we want might want something a little bit more. A little bit more in place. 
I'm sure they have nice crusts on them, but I think we can find nicer ones. Science, we're definitely moving more predictably now. Okay. We can start looking around for some sort of rock. Yeah. Uh, this is a pretty rocky spot. A little bit maybe landslidey, but... Yeah. Not, not loving it right now, so we, we okay. don't have to rush towards a rock. Very nice Aridogorgia, Agnesporalis. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Did I like, almost see didn't see that. Yeah, I know. <laughs> you like invisible oh, sometimes. Great. Yeah, they, they have evolved to avoid the sight of humans. Very good at that. But they haven't really, have they, right? Like. Yeah, no, they, that was a joke. No, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Usually not good when you have to explain it. <laughs> Gabby, Sometimes I'm glad you asked. I was thinking so hard about it. I was like, wait. <laughs> Sometimes yeah, better when you have to explain it. <laughs> I got uh, more laughs out of that for not knowing it was a joke <laughs> than if I had known. Yeah, there is a there's a really interesting uh, project going on. I kind of opened the door for myself to start talking about this project going on in the lab that I'm in. Um, where they've been looking at some researchers that Boston University and Harvard have been looking at um, immune systems and how immune systems evolve in the deep sea. Oh my gosh, I did not realize there were immune systems in the deep sea. Yeah. Tell me more. Or, you know, specifically immune systems of humans as well. So they, they looked at... Um, let me pull up the paper so I can explain this So properly. human immune systems came from the deep sea is is presumably where you're like no. immune systems started like back at this point in our evolutionary history. Oh yeah, there there, there are examples of you know um, immune systems use that with air quotes for now uh, yeah. going back through evolutionary time. Mm -hmm. um, but specifically this this one study uh, that was came out earlier this year and I think it was Science immunology was the uh, used 
um, deep sea microbes that were cultured from a cruise that we did back in 2017, uh, further south in the Phoenix Islands. Oh, wow. They cultured um, bacteria that were on corals and sponges and things like that and tested the bacteria against um, immune, uh, against human cells to see if the human cells and their uh, immune systems could recognize um, the microbes as, you know, hey, this is something bad. Maybe we should recognize it and attack it. Hmm. And uh, oh, m m sorry, mammalian mu uh, immune systems. I don't want to imply that humans were used in this. Um, so I think they used uh, mice. Um, but they found that uh, the mammalian immune system had no way to detect any of the microbes that were cultured from the deep sea. So mm -hmm. essentially that means that your immune system is completely blind to the microbes that have evolved in the deep sea. And it's a really kind of a really interesting observation because it suggests that you know, if you haven't had exposure to certain kinds of microbes uh, in your evolutionary history, that, you know, there could be these kind of yeah. parallel ev evolutionary processes it. going on. Uh, Steve, just to double yeah. check, um, we are going to kind of head upslope still towards the next waypoint. Right. Awesome. Yep. Bridge, Nev? That's fascinating. Yeah. So different ways of developing, or we have oh, different sure. examples of We're immune ready systems to get developing. Underway. Can we move 100 meters, bearing 160? So your immune system is is kind of like you know what you're that exposed to locally. You know, locally being your you know, the habitat you inhabit, and uh, not so much like all the biology that you know is related to you know those things that might be. Roger that. We're gonna intentionally lose um, our. You might have Argus camera for a moment. Okay. I mean, that's very fascinating in this time, <laughs> especially when we're thinking a lot about yeah. immune systems. Yeah. And exposure to new viruses and such. Um, huh. It doesn't imply that you know these are kind of pathogenic things down here to to humans, but it just it does suggest that you know there are places life uh, there are places that life occurs on earth that uh, you know, mammalian immune cells might not be able to detect or pick up so it could potentially even leave us susceptible uh, but we went back um, this year and kind of flipped that question around and said okay well these deep water corals and sponges can they detect you know shallow water uh, mm. microbes and uh, do they have ever immune response to that so that that research is underway okay. you can bring it up when you want and you're involved in that the or tracking that i, guess. I, I am involved in that i am helping to Experience the researchers that. identify the corals that they're interested in and that's really cool yeah it's quite a process uh the original paper was published as part of a dissertation um, by a researcher at Harvard and uh, also associated with the lab at Boston University. And so this uh, this project is ongoing. I suspect it'll be ongoing for a few years. So what? It, how do you tell? So you're, um, you're exposing, say, a deep sea sponge or coral to another environment's microbe yeah you, you and can, then how would you know yep. how do you know whether it can like detect it or not or what's the process for that does that make sense uh you can look at kind of the the proteins of some of these um um on some of these animals when they interact there might be chemical reactions you can detect um a lot of sequencing uh, uh, determine if any of the um, 
organisms are in interacting with one, one another. I've reached the end of my knowledge on the <laughs> topic. You gave him no, one six zero. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, I saw that he's not quite there, but I think. Yeah, I think another, he'll figure it out. Yeah, I think yeah, it'll, it looks like he's been able to do some stuff. So. But it no. is kind of interesting in a in a way, you know, if if the human immune system can be blind or you know the mammalian immune system can be blind to certain types of things you know you could theoretically use those pathways you know those things that the immune system can't detect as a way of getting like new drugs into the body into places that you know might not be so easy to do uh, if you have a very vibrant immune system uh, so that's being investigated huh. We've gotten a lot of follow-up questions already. People are into this topic. Oh, yeah. Um, but most of them are surrounding, are there any known potential oceanic viruses or deep-sea viruses that we might be worried about, or do we know much about? Yeah, so th there are tons of viruses in the ocean, but to the best of our knowledge, uh, very few of them are pathogenic um, You know, at these depths in the deep sea. Um, you know, I, I think, you know, this would be a great question if, if Beth was here, our lead scientist from the last cruise, she's a microbiologist, um, as well. And she studies things like bacteria and microbes in the deep sea, sediments, in the water column on the rocks. Uh, but no, you know, it's not like, you know, the, the ocean or the deep ocean is a source of human pathogenic um, you know, organisms naturally. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to track this study. Mm -hmm. That's yeah, very so cool. I, I, can, uh, I can send you a link to it. There's, it's got some popular press. Steve, I don't know if you talked about this already, but um, what what does it mean for these critters to have an immune system? Like, how do they get rid of things? Is it just by uh, natural products, just like defensive chemicals? Or what does it mean to have an immune system if you're, say, a coral? Yeah. Um, for corals and sponges, you know, sponges do have specific cells that kind of go out and attack, you know, invading things. Um, so that's kind of like a very basal immune system. Um, Corals also, to some degree, have, uh, you know, they produce a lot of secondary metabolites. Sponges do this as well. Some of those secondary metabolites, it's a fancy way of saying defensive chemicals, um, may be, you know, useful um, for understanding their function, uh, their, their wider function, you know, as some sort of, you know, precursor to a, a drug or something like that. Um, or, you know, recently some, some animal proteins have been investigated as having, you know, anti-fouling capabilities, for example, that help protect certain, um, certain structures from becoming encrusted with all sorts of, uh, animal life. So, um, yeah, it, it's pretty variable. You know, I think, uh, there's a good deal of both uh, interest in how animals defend themselves against disease. Uh, there should be, at least in the deep sea. I think there's a lot of uh, predation and a lot of uh, you know, these types of ecological variables we don't really have a good understanding of. At the same time, um, you know, we, we also don't know a lot about how diseases occur and what diseases, diseases look like in the deep sea for corals and sponges naturally. So trying to predict how they respond to them is kind of the second question or a later question after just trying to identify how they might be physically looking, 